Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Forest Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks so that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging on to our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. give it to me straight. I just want to know the facts. I want to know what's going on. Um, do not give me anything that isn't pertinent. Do not give me anything that is extremist. Do not give me anything that is not true. Don't just tell me what I want to hear. Tell me the facts. So some of you are like that. And then probably most of us <laughs> have a tendency to be the kind of people who say, Tell me what I want to hear. Just don't, don't tell me that stuff. I don't want to hear it. You know, it's like not listening, not listening, right? I don't want to hear it if it doesn't make me feel good. I don't want to hear it if it might be hard. I don't want to hear it if it may be difficult. All of that, right? However, the last few weeks, actually the last few months, we've been in Revelation and we have been hearing how difficult things are going to be in the last days. And that may have bothered some of you. Some of you may be thinking, oh, oh, I don't know if I want to listen to this. Oh, I don't want to think about this. You know, we have learned in Revelation that um, 12, that the dragon was hurled to the earth and went to make war against those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's us. So we see, um, while we have an adversary right now, it's going to be ramped up. That's a little scary. We read in Revelation 13, where the second beast or the false prophet deceived the inhabitants of the earth through miraculous signs, so they worship the beast and get the mark of the beast to buy and sell. We talked about that last week. Some of you, that may have unsettled you a little bit. You may be, be thinking, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. No, no. Right? We're already hearing stories about increased persecution of Christians around the world. ISIS, you, you cannot turn on the news without hearing about ISIS, hearing about people being beheaded. Um, some of you, um, a few months ago, followed the story of Miriam um, Abraham, the Sudanese woman who um, had married a Christian, and um, there's a death threat on her. She was in prison. She had a baby in prison. Now she's free, thankfully. But... Terrible, terrible things. It's very scary, right? It's very overwhelming. So, what if someone came on the scene offering a shortcut? Oh, whoops, I forgot to click. I'm back to click. I click too much. So, what if someone came on the scene offering a shortcut? An alternative way that seemed more appealing than continuing on the present course. Would you go for it? Would you take a shortcut? Would you sell out? Now let's look at when that actually happened. Now, actually it wasn't David, but David is part of the historical background I'm going to give you to set you up about the people who took the shortcut, okay? Most of you are familiar with David. He was called a man after God's own heart. And his son, King Solomon, was known for his extreme wisdom and his extreme riches. That's hard to say fast. Wisdom and riches. 
But Solomon strayed from following the Lord in his old age. And because of this, God decreed that after he died, the kingdom would be divided. The larger portion, the northern kingdom, Israel, um, was ruled by a succession of ungodly kings. King after king after king, and none of them served the Lord. The smaller portion, southern kingdom, Judah, was ruled by David and Solomon's descendants. And some of them were godly and some of them were not. Well, time went on, and because the Israelites refused to serve the Lord, God allowed the northern kingdom to be invaded and conquered by the barbaric, brutal Assyrians. The Assyrians were known for their brutality, um, you know, putting people's heads up on posts. They, they did that. And so the, na the um, ten tribes of Israel, which was, was basically the nation of Israel, was captured, taken off by the Assyrians. It was a brutal, bloody time. Well, some years later, the southern kingdom, whoops, let me go back. The southern kingdom, which was, oh dear. <laughs> you can see how good I am at the clicker. I just had new clicker practice. All right, <coughs> anyway. Oh no! <laughs> All right, we'll get there. So you guys, this is, Weak spot. Okay. <laughs> the Southern Kingdom. <laughs> I've entertained you at least, right? <laughs> yeah, that lady kept clicking. And, um, the Southern Kingdom was invaded and taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And if you have read the book of Daniel, Daniel was one of those who was taken into captivity. Now, Jeremiah, you know that long book in the middle of of the Bible in the Old Testament, Jeremiah the prophet had prophesied this. And in fact, in Jeremiah 25, the Lord had told Jeremiah that 70 years of Babylonian captivity would take place, and at the end of the 70 years, the Jewish people would be free. Now, would you want to hear 70 years? You're going into captivity for 70 years, because most of you, what does that mean? And the, except for the really young ones, you're gonna die in captivity. It's it. You're going to die in captivity. Um, but God said, after 70 years, you'll be free. There is hope for your children. Okay? But people didn't want to hear it. And Jeremiah received death threats. And as the political and military pressure from Babylon continued to escalate, God told Jeremiah, here's the picture, we to make a yoke and wear it. And his wearing of that yoke signified the control of Babylon over the entire region. So that brings us to Jeremiah 28. And if you um, have your Bible and you want to follow along, you can. So I'm going to read from Jeremiah 28. In the fifth month of the same year, the fourth year, early in the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azur, who was from Gibeon, said to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and the people, this is what the Lord of Almighty, the God of Israel, says, I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So remember, Jeremiah is wearing this yoke because God said, put on this yoke, walk around with it, wear it, because it's a sign to people of what I'm going to do. So Hananiah says, within two years, I will bring back to this place all the articles of the Lord house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, removed from here and took to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, all the other exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. And so Jeremiah replied before the people and the priests, everyone who was standing in the house of the Lord, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words you have prophesied by bringing the articles of the Lord's house and all the exiles back to this place from Babylon. And that was a little sarcastic on Jeremiah's part. He's like, yeah, right. Sounds good to me. That's kind of his, his attitude in saying that, okay? He said, nevertheless, listen to what I have to say in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. From early times, the prophets who preceded you and me have prophesied war, disaster, and plague against many countries and great kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as truly sent by the Lord 
only if his prediction comes true. And so then Hananiah had had it with Jeremiah. He took the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah and broke it. He said in front of everybody, and I'm just going to paraphrase it. This is what the Lord says. In the same way will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, off the neck of the nations in two years. And Jeremiah went on his way. So, what happened? Shortly after the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Go tell Hananiah. This is what the Lord says. You broke a wooden yoke, but in its place you will get a yoke of iron. This is what the Lord says. I will put an iron yoke on the necks of all those nations to make them serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. They will serve him, and I will even give him control over the wild animals. And so Jeremiah said to Hananiah, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord hasn't sent you, and yet you persuaded everyone to trust in lies. And therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to remove you from the face of the earth. This very year you're going to die because you have preached rebellion. And in the seventh month of that same year, Hananiah died. Okay, so let's look at this situation. So Jeremiah had given a word that no one wanted to hear. Seventy years, you're kidding me, right? Seventy years of captivity. Now, it's important to, to think, why were there seventy years of captivity? Going back to the slide that I kept messing up on, why were the northern kingdom taken by the, the Assyrians, why were, were the people in Judah taken by Babylonians? Why? Why did God let that happen? Well, because the people wouldn't listen to God. They wouldn't serve God. Prophet after prophet, all through the whole time of the king, said to the people, serve God, serve God, serve God. And the people said, eh, we'll, we'll serve idols, thank you very much. And the people wouldn't listen. And God brought that disaster finally as a consequence for their disobedience. So it's kind of like when you're a little kid and, and you get in trouble and your mom, you know, decrees some kind of punishment for you and then you try and say, well, I'll do this instead. Have you ever had that happen? I have a funny story about um, one of my daughters, not Kara, who's here, but my middle daughter, um, Katie, when she was like in fourth grade, um, she just had, I can't even remember what she did, but, but she really had crossed the line. And I was trying to think, what am I going to do to get her attention so that, you know, to do some turning on the inside of her? And I had this brilliant idea. I said to Katie, um, you're going to wear a dress to school tomorrow. Because back then, at that time, Wearing dresses to school wasn't really popular. I know a lot of you girls wear dresses to school right now, but it, it wasn't popular at that time. And Katie's like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And so all the whole evening, she argued with me. And, and she kept hoping I would change my mind. She kept hoping I would relent. And she got up the next morning. And she had this one pair of khaki pants that she absolutely hated, but, you know, they were a little dressier, so she put those on and came down, hoping that I would say that. And I'm like, no, nope. <laughs> put the dress on. <laughs> so Katie had to go to school in the dress. You know what, we, she and I both laugh about that. We, we still remember, but it, it got her attention. And God, sometimes it takes really strong things to get our attention, right? Those of you who are parents, sometimes it takes a lot to get his attention. And this um, captivity is what it took to get the people's attention. And so, just like my daughter Katie tried to short circuit and come downstairs in the khakis, so Hannah and I is like, oh, two years, just two years and we'll be back. Because who doesn't want to hear two years instead of 70 years? But it wasn't the truth. It wasn't what God said. It was telling the people what they wanted to hear. So in the next chapter, we find the text of a letter that Jeremiah wrote to those who have been exiled. 
And so in Jeremiah 29, I'm just going to um, start in verse 4, but I may skip through a little bit. So This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I've carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce. Marry, have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons, give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel says. Don't let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you, like Hananiah. Don't listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They're prophesying lies to you in my name. I haven't sent them, sent them, declares the Lord. So what God is saying to Jeremiah, to the people, is this. Listen, take your punishment. 70 years is happening. Now you can either fight it or you can go with it. But I am advising you to go with it because this is what I've decreed. You go with it, you be obedient, and multiply while you're there. Get strong while you're there. That's what God is saying. Now, um, we're going to get to a verse that many of you know very well. But let me read on. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. Now, here's the verse that every, all of you quote. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. I will bring you back from captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you. I'll bring you back to the place from where I carried you into exile. I thought um, you might be interested, probably you never understood those verses in that context. Sometimes we take those verses, oh yeah, yeah, da, 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 it's all great. And you know what? For each one of us here, God has something good. God has good plans for each one of us. He wants to prosper us. He doesn't want us to be harmed. But what's the overarching context? that's happening here. You need to do what God says and go with it. You need to take the hard truth and go with it. If you take the hard truth and go with it, it will pay off. I will prosper you and not harm you. You know what we do sometimes? We just hear what we want to hear. We just hear, oh, God's going to prosper me. God's going to harm good, got good plans for me. But we don't even really listen to what those plans are that God has for us. We just think, oh, God's got good plans for me. Yay, yay, yay. But the context of this verse is obey what God says and go with his plan because that's not what's going to pay off. So even when you hear things you don't really want to hear, you have to go with God's plan. Because that's how you prosper. Even my daughter in having to obey about wearing a dress, you know what happened? It broke something in her. It broke some disobedience of a rebellious streak in her. And, um, and that was the purpose. So actually good came to her. She was better off. If, if she, I would have let her out with me, and I would have let her have her way, she would have found the next bad thing to do. You understand? But God sometimes takes us into circumstances to get our attention and work in our lives. And we have to see the overall plan that he has. These are verses of hope. These are verses that will show us that God is in control. He's not surprised at anything that happens to us. They're verses that tell us the plans of God are good and they will prevail. So what can we take from this? First, God is in control then and now. He's in control. We're really not, even though we like to be. He's in control. We can trust Him. We can trust God. You know, ah, 
God knows the beginning to the end. We don't. We only know the scope of our own human understanding, and for each of us that's different. It depends on our setting, it depends on our context, it depends on um, our personality, but our scope of understanding is limited. We only see so much, and any of you who have been up in an airplane and looked at the whole view, or even if you just go to Google Earth, <laughs> look at the big view, you see there's a whole lot more than what you see just in your little context. We have to trust God. And because we trust Him, we don't need to fear the future. The Israelite, I mean, the people of Judah, uh, Israelites is kind of a catch-all term, but the people of Judah were taken into captivity for 70 years, and they were understandably quite nervous about that and not looking forward to it. And God said, go with it. Just go with it. Make it work. You know, don't fight it. Go ahead and go into captivity. Expect to be in captivity and prosper while you're in captivity. So we don't need to be afraid of what the future holds because God sees the big picture. But... We have to be careful who we listen to. We must be very careful, especially in today, the information age, the internet, the TV. Every, we have voices coming from everywhere, and it's very easy to get caught up in what people are saying. And you must be careful, because disobedience brings dire consequences. The nation's disobedience was the reason that God allowed Israel to be divided first and then both sides to be captured. And throughout the time of the kings, God sent prophets who warned of dire consequences if the Israelites didn't return to serving him. And guess what? They didn't listen. And today we see the same thing happening. There is people all over the world who have blatantly rejected God. And there are those who have chosen their own version of the message, like Hananiah did. You know, Hananiah didn't say there won't be any captivity. He said, oh, two years and you're out. And there are people everywhere, and you don't have to look very far, that are giving their own version of the message. Well, really what God is saying is this. Well, really what the Bible says is this. Well, I don't expect that God would actually have said that. How could God have meant that? Surely he didn't mean that. And you hear it everywhere. And I want to take you to Genesis 3 in the Garden of Eden. And you notice the serpent didn't flat out oppose God right to start. Rather, he planted seeds of doubt. He said, did God really say you shouldn't eat from any of the trees in the garden? Now remember, Adam and Eve had been given instructions don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There were a lot of other trees. And God just said, there's just this one tree. Don't eat from this one tree. So the serpent comes up. And it couldn't really say you couldn't eat any. And then, he said, um, so the woman said, well, we can eat fruit, fruit from the trees. But God said, don't eat the fruit from the tree that's in the middle. And you must not touch it or you'll die. And the serpent said, you won't die. God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like him, knowing good and evil. So, reasoning. Appealing to what you want to hear. The serpent told the woman what she wanted to hear. We have to. Well, that's, you know, basically how we can reason ourselves. Well, that, that's really stupid. It couldn't be that. No, no. Right? And she reasoned. And what did she do? She ate the fruit. And what happened? All of humanity has been in sin ever since. There were lasting consequences. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5, and I'm going to go there. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5 is a pretty accurate description of the times we live in now. Now this was written back 
2,000 years ago. But let's read it. Let's, let's see how much we relate to, okay? It says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful. Proud. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Whoa! I don't know about you, but that really resonates. I, I don't have to look very far in our society to see all of those things. And even in the church at large, we see, we see a lot of that. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Kind of like Hananiah saying, ah, two years, forget the 70. God, God wouldn't do that to you. This is a pretty accurate description. But Lynn, let's go on to verses 12 through 17, and I'm going to put part of it up here. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse. Let me read that again. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So, the things we see happening right now... They were foretold 2,000 years ago. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, it says, it's, it's not going to be good. But God's given us the tool. Stick with him and know the word of God. We can trust God. We can trust him. Get to know his word. You know, um, I teach at ABI, Angels Bible Institute, and my students, <laughs> I tell them all the time, these are people who are preparing to be ministers. I say, know the word of God. You must know the word of God. You cannot just say what your pastor told you. You must know the word of God. It's the same way I work with um, students of life. I'm reviewing them for polity. Um, interviews to get their license and it's like you have to know the word of God we have to know it and we will always be learning you'll never stop knowing the word of God I have been reading the Bible for about 50 years I've been reading the Bible okay literally I have read the Bible through I don't know how many times, probably 15 times at least, plus all the other reading. And I still am learning from the Word of God. Every time I read it, I learn something new. You must know the Word of God. You must not just be able to say, oh yeah, it says there's somewhere or this or that. You have to know what it says because that's what you're going to stand on. That's what's going to sustain you. And that's what you're going to give to other people. You have to know the Word of God. 
You have to determine to obey God. You have to make up your mind you're going to do it. Because the disobedience is what got mankind in trouble in Genesis 3. It got the nations of Israel and Judah in trouble in the Old Testament. And it continues to get people in trouble today. You have to determine you're going to obey God. That's the choice you make. It's not something you do on your own strength. It's something you say, okay, God, I want to do this. Help me. Show me how to do it. And teach me your word that will help me understand how to obey it. And as I mentioned earlier, we know the end of the story. You know, the Bible I see as this grand overarching drama of good versus evil. God creates heaven and earth. He creates animals and plants and all that on the earth. He creates people. And the adversary comes and says, hmm. I'm going to mess up God's creation a little bit. And so the adversary comes, and the whole rest of the Bible is about God saying, no, I want these people back. I want these people. They're mine. The whole Bible is about that struggle between good and evil and the tension. And when we get to the end of Revelation in the next weeks, we're going to see God wins. God wins. Evil loses and God wins. And you already know in your life, every single one of you have experienced how good has won out in some situation in your life. All of you have experienced the payoff of doing something right and doing something good, even when it was hard. We've all, think of an example when that's happened for you. Okay, now, don't make that the exception. Make that the rule. Make it the rule. You can trust God. He has a good plan for you. But you have to go 100% with him. So who are you going to listen to? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can trust you. We thank you, Lord, that... Um, that you care about us and you don't give up on us and you keep pursuing us and you gave your son for us so that we could be with you forever. Father, I pray you'll speak to our hearts now. Reveal those areas where we really haven't trusted you. Prep, prep our hearts in those areas where we cannot have said, don't tell me, don't tell me that, I want to hear it. Father, those things we don't want to hear, will you please change our hearts and open our ears to hear them? Help us to listen by faith, and Lord, then I ask that you will give us understanding that will grow as we step out in faith and obey you. Thank you, Lord, that your plans are good. Your plans are good. We want to be part of your plan. In Jesus' name.
be lifted high our love be lifted high in my life be lifted high our world be lifted
morning. Might be something a little, might be something big, but something, some way we can respond to God's faithfulness. So as I sing this again, let's reflect, let's think, let's ask God what we can do for Him. Oh 
excited about it. He's putting us through it for a reason. And so we trust that all good, all things do work together for His good, not our own. And I don't know about you, church, but as long as it's working together for His good, I think we're in pretty good shape. So, God bless you guys. Have a great week. Have a great Sunday. And uh, see you back next week because we're going to revisit, remember those 144,000 people we read about earlier in the book of Revelation? They come back again in the next chapter, so we're going to revisit what they've been up to. So God bless you guys.
We hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a Foursquare Christian Church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626 914 3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.